And finally, with all of this, we finally, at the end, have two pyruvates. This is the structure of pyruvate right there. That's what it looks like. Okay, this is video two, continuation of cellular respiration. We did stages one and two. Now we're on stage three, which is the hardest, the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle is also called the citric acid cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle or the TCA. It was discovered by Hans Krebs in 1930, and it occurs in the mitochondria. That's where we already are with our pyruvate changing to acetyl coenzyme A. We're in the matrix, though, and that's where the enzymes are. The main purpose of the Krebs cycle is to create carbon dioxide, NADH, and FADH2. We're not going to make a lot of ATP in this stage. The key components is making the NADH and the FADH2, because then those will be turned into ATP later on. The carbon dioxide that's produced is not so important as these hydrogens. Um, the hydrogens are used to create lots of energy in the last stage. This cycle only creates two ATPs. There are eight steps. Here we go. So here's our diagram again. We are in stage three, the Krebs cycle. And there is a diagram in the outline, if you're using the outline, that you can follow along and fill in the bullets at the same time. Okay, stage number one, we are up here. Here's our acetyl coenzyme A. So acetyl coenzyme A is going to add with acetyl oxalo, sorry, oxalo acetate. Um, remember, acetyl coenzyme A is two carbons, and oxalo acetate is four carbons. So two plus four equals six carbons. So citric acid or citrate is the name of our product, and that is a six carbon product. Um, in this step, carb coenzyme A is going to leave again and then re be re used in stage two. And that's all for step one. Step number two is going to change citrate to its isomer, isocitrate, by adding water and removing water. It's just the arrangement of atoms. Here is those, um, for those of you who like the chemistry part, here's the chemistry showing oxaloacetate plus the acetyl coenzyme A. Coenzyme A leaves, there's your enzyme. We get citrate, and then citrate is added water and removed water to make its um, isomer isocitrate. All right, step three, we're going to do oxidative decarboxylation. So carboxylation, decarboxylation means we're going to remove carbon dioxide. Um, remember, we're actually removing a carboxyl group, and so that gets subtracted. The carbon dioxide gets released, and that hydrogen adds to NAD plus to make NADH. The new molecule after that is called alpha-ketoglutarate. And it, instead of it being a six-carbon molecule because we remove carbon dioxide, it is a five-carbon molecule. All right, in step four, oxidative decarboxylation occurs again. So this time, though, we have coenzyme A adding. You might need to add that to your diagram. And carbon dioxide leaves. The hydrogen gets added to NAD plus to make NADH. And alpha-ketoglutarate, which was a five-carbon molecule, turns into succinyl coenzyme A, which is a four-carbon molecule. All right, in step five, we have coenzyme A leaving, and we have a coupled reaction occurring. ADP is going to get made into GDP, which is the same thing as ADP, except it's a different nitrogen base. And then GDP is going to get the inorganic phosphate added to it, creating GTP, which can then be converted into ATP. All of those crazy coupling steps um, turns succinyl coenzyme A into succinate. Succinate, then, is still a four-carbon molecule. All right, so here's for your chemistry people. Here's isocitrate um, being decarboxylationed uh, with their enzyme, and then it's turned into alpha-ketoglutarate, which is five carbons, gets decarboxylated again, and now we have a four-carbon molecule, but it has that coenzyme A attached to it, very unstable bond. That turns into, with this coupled reaction, into succinate, which is a four-carbon molecule. All right, in step six, we have dehydrogenation. Dehydrogenation is the removal of hydrogens. Succinate, which is four carbons, is going to lose two hydrogens and an electron to become fumarate. And those hydrogens that come off are going to be added to FAD to make FADH2. FAD is similar to NAD+. NAD plus. Um, FADH2 is like NADH. It has those high-energy hydrogens that will be used in the next step. In step seven, hydration. Water is just added to fumarate to make malate. We are still at a four carbon molecule. And the last step is malate being turned into oxaloacetate. How does that occur? Dehydrogenation. A two hydrogens and O1 electron are removed from malate 
and that forms oxaloacetate, which is our four carbon molecule, which will then be reused in the cycle to add to the two carbon um, acetylcoenzyme A to make our six carbon citrate. Here's the chemistry. There's our fumarate. Water is added to make malate. Dehydrogenation to make oxaloacetate. So here is our overall for Krebs cycle. The requirements for a Krebs cycle overall is acetylcoenzyme A that starts the whole thing. Three NAD pluses are needed to accept the hydrogens. One ADP is, is needed. One FAD is needed. Water is needed. And an inorganic phosphate is needed. Remember, there are two glucose got split in half, so all of this list is actually doubled. For the products, we end up with two carbon dioxides that were released from decarboxylation. We made three NADHs, one ATP, and one FADH2. Again, this list is doubled. Um, and so you can see the Krebs cycle produced the most of a lot of energy, but it was in the form of NADH and FADH2. Notice that in your requirements, this stage did not require oxygen. Okay, so just looking at where we're at right now when we, um, we're catabolizing, meaning breaking down glucose, by the end of two turns of the Krebs cycle, glucose was catabolized to six carbon dioxides, two from the um, coenzyme A step and four from Krebs, 10 NADHs, two from glycolysis, two from the coenzyme A step, and six from Krebs, and we made two FADH2s from Krebs, and we made four ATPs, two from glycolysis and two from Krebs. So here is our last stage, stage four, which is a redox reaction in the electron transport chain. The electron carriers NADH and FADH2 are going to experience cyclic oxidation and reduction, which is redox, as the electron and proton pairs pass through the electron transport chain. The energy of these electrons steadily drops as they move through the electron transport chain. Energy is tapped off the stream of electrons by pumping protons into the intermembrane space of the mitochondria. You already learned this in photosynthesis. So the electron transport system is a collection of protein complexes that are structurally linked into units. All of these are on the inner membrane of the mitochondria. These protein complexes do not have um, crazy names or anything. They're just called complex 1, complex 2, complex 3, and complex 4. If you remember from photosynthesis, you had names of these proteins. All right, specifically, complex 1 is going to accept the electrons from NADH from glycolysis, the formation of acetylcoenzyme A, and the Krebs cycle. Complex 2 is going to accept the electrons from FADH2, and they're going to pass them on to complex 3. The electrons from complex 3 are accepted by complex 4, which is actually has a name. It's called cytochrome oxidase, which is an enzyme that combines oxygen with protons and electrons to produce water. Water is the stable, final electron acceptor that easily moves away from the reaction site. Okay, here is a picture of the electron transport system. As you can see, what's feeding into this electron transport system is NADH and FADH2. Remember those high energy hydrogens. Those hydrogens are going to break down in the protons and electrons. We're only going to look at the electrons right now. The electrons are going to pass from in the proteins of the, the inner membrane of the um, mitochondria, the cristae. And so we're going to get all these complexes, these electrons are going to go from complex to complex and eventually make water, being accepted by oxygen. At the same time, we have a proton pump or chemiosmosis occurring. NADH and FADH2 are pumping their hydrogens or their protons as well through these protein complexes out of the matrix and into the intermembrane space. This is creating an imbalance of protons causing a proton gradient. Due to the proton gradient, there's a lot of potential energy resulting from the difference in pH and electrical charge. So this is showing it on the um, inner membrane of the mitochondria. These protons are going to be pumped through that membrane and into the intermembrane space. So there was, um, we have a lot of positive here and we have a lot of negative here. And so that's creating a charge on the membrane, a lot of potential energy. All right, so the only way the protons can get back into the matrix is by a fifth specific protein complex called ATP synthase. Through diffusion, the protons go through ATP synthase and back into the matrix. This diffusion is exergonic, and this energy provided allows ADP and an inorganic phosphates to bond, creating ATP. All right, so this is another picture of the electron transport chain, but this is more focusing on the proton pump or the chemiosmosis. So here is our NADH and our FADH2. 
the electrons and protons are coming off of those molecules. We're not looking at the electrons right now. We're only looking at the protons. The protons are being pumped through these protein complexes, okay? And they're all gathering over here in the intermembrane space, creating a lot of positive charges out here. That creates an, a lot of potential energy and a electric charge. The only way they can get back out, or back in, I should say, to the matrix is through this ATP synthase. So they get pumped through this ATP synthase, and that drives the energy to add inorganic phosphate to the ADP to make our ATP, which is the whole goal of cellular respiration. So you look at the overall adding up of all the um, ATPs being made, we end up with a 32 to 34 ATPs being made with stage 4. Um, some of them are made in the individual steps, and some of them are made um, through the membrane. Okay, so this is um, kind of what the other slide was showing, the ATP production. Two of the ATPs were made from glycolysis, and two of them were made from Krebs. Those two that were made from the Krebs and glycolysis, that is called substrate level phosphorylation. The um, 32 to 34 from the electron transport chain in chemiosmosis, those were made from oxidative phosphorylation. Usually NADH will yield 2 to 3 ATPs each. Um, it varies. FADH2 will yield 2 ATPs each. So there is a range on the number of ATPs that can be made. Um, it usually ranges from 36 to 38. So here's another picture of the mitochondria membrane. Here's the outer membrane and the inner membrane. Um, and here's the intermembrane space. Here, there are names for these complexes, complex 1, 2, 3, and 4. But again, you're not going to have to worry about those crazy names. They're all just enzymes. Um, and then it's just, just showing that NADH gets turned into NAD+. FADH2 gets turned into FAD because they're both being oxidized. The hydrogens are being pumped through the complexes. The electrons are going through the electron transport chain. Overall, at the end, it's the oxygen and these protons and electrons that are going to turn into water. All right, so for stage four, here is our overall ETC. Um, the requirements for the electron transport chain is the two energy molecules, NADH and FADH2. You also need ADP and you need oxygen. This is aerobic. You need oxygen to accept those protons. The products of electron transport chain are you get NAD plus left over, you get FAD that's left over, you make tons of ATP, and we make our water. So if you think about it, the main molecule that feeds into aerobic respiration is pyruvate, because if you didn't have pyruvate, you would never be able to get into um, the mitochondria. So pyruvate is feeding aerobic respiration. Um, it's actually the, the stopping point, or like where that pyruvate can go, because it either can go in the mitochondria if the organism has it, or it can't. So pyruvate is the key molecule. In an aerobic organism, or if an, an organism is, is in high oxygen, that pyruvate will go to the mitochondria. If it's an anaerobic organism or the oxygen is low, it will go to fermentation. Fermentation is our example of anaerobic respiration. In anaerobic organisms, it will lead to the production of ethanol, or if it's in like a muscle cell, it will lead to lactic acid. All right, so let's look at alcoholic fermentation first. Alcoholic fermentation occurs in yeast and some bacteria. And so what's happening is you get glucose. It's still going through glycolysis. It's still making the pyruvate. That is nothing, that is, all organisms do that. But because there is no mitochondria available, that pyruvate is going to convert to acetaldehyde. And then that acetaldehyde will convert to ethanol. And then ethanol is used to produce beer, wine, and alcohol. Since it does not do the electron transport chain, only two ATPs from glycolysis are going to be made. It's very, very inefficient for these organisms, but that's all they can get. And then if you look at lactic acid fermentation, this is done by our human muscle cells um, that are under oxygen debt from heavily being exercised. It's also done by certain fungus and bacteria. Glucose will go under glycolysis and make the pyruvate. However, instead of going to the mitochondria because there's low oxygen available, it will make lactate or lactic acid. Lactate is then used to make yogurt, sauerkraut, etc. In our muscle cells, it is a toxin, and you feel that burn feeling when you're working out too, your muscles too hard. Um, it causes soreness and stiffness in muscles. It also is very inefficient and only can make those two ATPs per glucose from glycolysis. So here's the picture of ethanol 
fermentation or alcoholic fermentation, um, which is a picture of the yeast on the right. But here's a picture on the left of alcoholic fermentation. Here's your glucose being made into pyruvate. Pyruvate gets turned into ethyl alcohol, and you actually release carbon dioxide. You only make two ATPs from glycolysis. And then if it's a muscle cell or lactic acid fermentation, glucose makes its pyruvate, and pyruvate gets turned into lactate, and that's it. And the only ATPs you make are from glycolysis. And that finishes up our uh, video two of cellular respiration. Hope this is helpful.